on the catalog of mental health measures, discovering the depths of mental health data in UK longitudinal studies. My name is Beate Lichtwart. I'm from the UK Data Service at the University of Essex, and I will be joined today by Louise Arsenault and Bridget Ryan from King's College London. My background is I'm a quantitative social scientist, uh, and I've undertaken research back in Berlin at the, Institute, uh, at the Max Planck Institute for um, Human Development, and here at the Institute for Social and Economic Working in research support and training at the UK Data Service at the University of Essex here. Now, I would like to introduce to you, and I'm very happy to be able to introduce to you, Louise Arsenault and Bridget Bryan. So, Louise Arsenault is the Economic and Social Research Council Mental Health Leadership Fellow. Her fellow role with the ESRC includes providing intellectual leadership and strategic advice in the priority area of mental health. She provides advice on how social science research can best address the challenges and skills. Richard Bryan's research focuses on the production and maintenance of mental health inequalities using qualitative and quantitative approaches. She joined the team in July 2018 to undertake a review of the mental health measures in British longitudinal studies and assist in the development of the catalogue. As you can see from our listing, we will start with Louise Arsenault and Richard Bryan uh, with the title What, Who and How? discovering the depths of mental health data in UK longitudinal studies. And um, good afternoon, and thank you for joining this um, webinar. So I am Louise Arsenault, and I will speak to you for the first um, 20, 25 minutes. And that portion of the um, webinar today will provide you um, some background about the project that we started um, two years ago. And um, after that, Bridget will take over and Bridget will give you kind of practical um, um, advice and, and she will kind of show you a bit the content of the catalog and how to use it. But I will start by um, giving you um, just some background. Um, <clears throat> so the, um, the first point I would want to make today um, is, is really to highlight and to emphasize the importance of doing mental health research. Um, I think that more than ever, doing mental health research was important before. The pandemic has just highlighted, you know, the urgency for um, studying the causes, the prevalence, the symptoms, the trajectories, the onset, the outcomes, the risk factors for um, having mental health problems. I think that it's quite clear that there is a crisis at the moment and we do need um, more research to inform um, uh, detection, treatment, prevention of uh, mental health problems. And um, I don't think that you need to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist to be doing mental health research. I think it's really important that people with the background um, in psychology, psychiatry, or uh, professionals in mental health um, conduct research on mental health. I think it's also important that people from different backgrounds integrate mental health as part of their um, research program. And in some ways, that is exactly what the catalog aims to do, is to really inform um, people about existing data on mental health that have been collected as part of longitudinal and cohort studies based in the UK. And that project was developed as part of my mental health leadership um, fellowship with the Economic and Social um, Research Councils, um, where I proposed to the ESRC to um, um, really facilitate mental health research and maximize the uptake of existing data as part of cohort and longitudinal studies. So the project aims was really to create a hub that has information about already collected data on mental health and well-being in UK longitudinal and cohort studies. That project was funded only for one year, so we really had to kind of have a focus and, and determine a little bit the boundaries of the project. So um, we decided to agree to focus only on UK um, studies for the time being. The aim was also to encourage the use of mental health measures in the UK cohorts, especially for disciplines outside the field of mental health and also among early career researchers. 
So what we want to do is really to facilitate the uptake of mental health measures, not just by mental health professionals and mental health researchers, also by people from other disciplines and helping them to integrate mental health as part of their um, research. And second of all, we thought that it would be really important to have a tool, the platform, to support young researchers, you know, in developing their mental health, their um, program of research on mental health, without having to focus too much on getting grants at the same time, so that they can build a portfolio of publications using data already collected and quite often that are underused. Finally, another aim of the project was to promote projects on the harmonization uh, of mental health measures and also to facilitate the work across different cohorts. By providing lots of information of mental health measures, the catalog facilitate that kind of work. So at this point, I want to just catch up my breath and also kind of acknowledge the contribution of the team. So it's not just me um, working on that project. So you will meet um, Bridget, who kind of um, worked with me on that project from the, um, the very beginning. So quite a lot of the work that we will present, it's basically Bridget's work. Um, there's also uh, Barbara Mon, who is working here at the uh, King's College London. And Barbara has conducted a lot of work on mental health and um, using data from cohort and longitudinal studies. So basically, she's a data dictionary on two, on two feet. So we really try to squeeze as much information as possible from, from Barbara. So that's really uh, important. And then Lily kind of joined us as well just recently. So she's a new kind of team member. And Lily had the huge task of reviewing all the mental health measures as part of ALSPAC, which is a huge um, study. Um, and now she's going to take over and, and get involved in other projects as well. And here you have John Rogers, who's a very important member of our team. Um, he is basically the web developer. So he's the one who developed the catalog itself as the way that um, you can see it all. So let me break down the, um, the catalog in a few different uh, parts. And the first element, which is really important for the catalog, are the studies. And again, I mentioned to you that this was funded for a year only. We had to narrow down which studies we could focus on to include them in the catalog. So we decided to focus on, on specific cohorts that met few criteria. And one of them was to include cohort studies or longitudinal studies that had multiple waves of data collection. So we cannot take just a, um, a one-off study or a snapshot um, study. We really wanted to have studies that had uh, uh, repeated assessment phases. We also, of course, this is about mental health, so it has to contain data on mental health. It has to have at least 200 participants at the first sweep. It had to be collected in the context of uh, British or in collected from British context. So we also have some international studies, but they have a big kind of British uh, component. And the study had to be ongoing. And that's a bit of a loose kind of criteria. You may say, you know, who knows about, you know, longitudinal studies. It's difficult to know from one year to the next whether they're still kind of ongoing. Um, so that's a little bit of a loose um, criteria. We wanted to hear from the study team whether they had plans to collect more data and most importantly whether they had the staff to handle requests to access the data. Um, <clears throat> so we managed to identify 46 studies uh, that met all those criteria. So I don't know about you, but I was quite surprised by this number uh, when we first started the project, you know, and I realized, oh, I think that that's bigger than what um, I, I thought I would be able to, to do. So these are the names of the some of the cohorts included in the catalog. You may recognize some of them. It's important to mention that um, we do have quite a number of cohorts that are focusing on aging, so which is really important these days. So um, I think that this is something uh, really valuable in the UK. Um, one thing which, which was important for the catalogue was to make sure that we had a coverage of the four nations. So we do have studies from Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and um, England as well. Um, 
And then we do have um, some occupational studies as well, not very many, but a few of them. We do have twin studies um, too, which are included in the, in the catalog. So hopefully you could kind of recognize um, some of your favorite cohort studies as part of, um, of, of this kind of um, snapshot of what we have in the, in the catalog. Another unit as part of the catalog are the mental health topics. So we decided to focus on indicators of mental health problems, uh, measures of impairment or difficulties resulting from mental health problems, measures of treatment, service use, and help seeking, and also measures of psychological well-being. So we didn't want to focus on studies that um, was included in um, including kind of clinical population, but we want to see variation of mental health within the population. So the measures of psychological well-being was quite important in that context. However, again, because of constraints, time and, and funding constraint, we had to exclude anything which was kind of more cognitive measures, measures of personality and temperament. Having said that, we do have measures of personality disorders, but we do not have, um, we do not include the ocean, for example, which is a well-known measure of personality. We don't include that, although we may have to review that and at some point include that. Um, we also, um, we don't consider risk factors for mental health problems. So, for example, we do consider bullying behavior as an indicator of conduct problems, but we don't include bullying victimization, which is a risk factor for the development of mental health problems. So these are all the uh, mental health, we call them topic. Um, included or covered by um, the catalog. And it's really interesting that um, quite often we find new things that are not well covered by all the cohort studies, but something that one study kind of has, um, which other studies do not have. But you will see that um, there are kind of um, topics that are repeated um, across all the cohorts. So there are some very common one, and there are some that are not so well covered by um, the cohorts. Now, let me describe step by step what we did to develop the catalog. So the first part, what we do, um, so we did identify the, the cohort and the longitudinal studies that um, we can review. And we also kind of identified the topics and then step by step, we look the studies online and we check for key papers to have as much information as we can about the studies and about the measurement, what they included as part of their assessment. So we collect information and we organize the information about the measures, including um, the items, the informants, the reporting period. So it's quite detailed. And this is really kind of the work of Bridget. Once Bridget has reviewed a study, she's happy with all the information as part of her big kind of Excel sheets. Then we kind of discuss the review in a group, so with the team. And um, we quite often, we do have kind of questions whether we should consider this, whether we should remove that, how, what do we mean about this? So we do review together kind of um, topics that or things, points that are not so clear. Once we're really happy with the review, then we contact the study team and we ask them to check the work to make sure it's accurate and to make sure it is uh, complete as well. Once we heard back from the study and that they're okay with all the information that we're prepared to share with the rest, um, then we kind of pass this on to John who will upload that on the catalog. Um, and then we kind of do a bit of tests and then we can release um, the information. Here, this is a slide for me to catch up my breath once again, and also to thank all the studies that have been working with us so far. So I told you that we have 46 studies um, and all studies um, have accepted to work with us and they accepted to check with us, you know, the review, they provide information when we ask for them, they provide feedback, um, they kind of share with us, you know, the tweets and they kind of disseminate the catalog. And to be honest with you, when we started this project, that was a big fear that I had that the studies would not want, you know, wouldn't want to share the information, would not be interested, would not reply to my emails. Um, 
and you know it's been it's been great to work with all the cohorts um, and we're really grateful for their collaboration. So, so far, we've reviewed 92% of the identified um, studies. We have very few left um, to kind of cover. And that means that we've reviewed 3,000 mental health measures identified across more than 300 waves of data collection. In a nutshell, we have lots and lots of data, which is out there, accessible, but quite often they haven't been used as much as, you know, as much as they could or they should. Um, mental health topics that are mostly um, covered by the studies would include depression, anxiety, psychological distress, measures of well-being, alcohol and substance use. Um, they're the ones that we found across most of the studies, but quite often they're measured differently. Um, topics like eating disorders, gambling are probably less um, covered by the cohort um, so far. So what the catalog does, it does provide an engine um, to be able to search for mental health and well-being measures in UK cohorts and longitudinal studies. It does present detailed information about the measures, including the items, the response scales, the informants and the reporting period so that people who want to conduct research they know what is available in terms of mental health measures already available. Um, the catalog also highlights statistical properties of standard measures of mental health and well-being. So when a measure is assessed using a standard questionnaire, we provide information about that questionnaire itself. Um, the catalog points to data access policy, which can be different from one study to the next. And finally, we signpost resources for conducting longitudinal mental health research, including courses or online training. However, what the catalog doesn't do, it doesn't provide access to the data. So this is something that we really leave to the study to deal with. Um, quite often, different studies have different policy for data access, which have been agreed with the funders. Um, so in some ways, we don't step in and we don't want to change that. Um, but what we provide is really information on how to access the data. We don't include measures of appraisal for um, to the extent to which a measure is suitable for a particular project. So somehow we expect the researchers or the catalog users to do a bit of their homework beforehand and, and really kind of um, explore and investigate whether a measure is suitable for their project. We cannot kind of um, give that kind of um, assessment. As I said before, uh, we limit to, uh, the catalog is limited to mental health measures and we cannot cover um, other topics. We don't cover trials or experimental research either. And we don't provide research training. We can only kind of, um, um, give you information about what is available out there, but we don't provide such um, training. Here, I just want to mention that um, that my role as the fellow for the um, ESRC was renewed in March, you know, closely matched with a pandemic. Um, and when I proposed to the ESRC to renew my role, um, I didn't um, have COVID in mind, but there you go. Um, so we had to adapt and uh, Bridget um, and I with Barbara and Lily as well, we decided to um, include measures of mental health that were collected by cohorts and longitudinal studies in relation to COVID. So there's lots of information out there now about the impact of COVID on mental health collected as part of longitudinal studies. So the beauty of that is that those studies will provide measures of mental health and well-being prior to COVID and after um, COVID as well, or during COVID. And Bridget will show you uh, where to find all this information as part of the, as part of the catalog. We have detailed information um, as part of that. And just want to point out that 52% of the cohorts that we um, have in the catalog have taken the steps of collecting more data in the context of, of COVID. So there's, there's lots out there. So this is the, um, the front page of the catalog. So um, 
when we kind of um, were thinking about some kind of a theme, um, we really kind of got this idea of um, seeds, you know, that long time ago, the funders and lots of researchers kind of planted some seeds, you know, to collect um, information about mental health. And that kind of grew in beautiful data and that keeps on growing and growing and growing. And lots of information that have been collected a long time ago. Some people may think, you know, it's not interesting, it's not good, it's um, outdated. Actually, it's more valuable than ever um, in the context of what's going on right now. So it's really important to explore what we have and to make the most out of it. So there's also a link between, um, as you can see in front of you on the slides, um, uh, you see that we use the plants, the seeds, and then you can see that behind me, there's lots of plants as well. And usually Bridget will have lots of plants as well, but you, you, cannot, see, you cannot see that. Um, so, okay, at this point, I will invite everyone to either um, use your tablet, your phone, or your laptop, and you may want to um, join the, um, the catalog so you can have a look. I suspect that maybe some of you have already uh, done that, uh, but it would be important if you want to follow the next part with Bridget that you have access to the catalog. So we'll give you some time, and I can see that there are some questions. Is that right, Bridget? Yes. So I've just put the link to the catalog in the chat as well in case that makes it easier for anyone. Um, and yes, so we have a couple of questions from Lawrence about some of the studies that might suit their research. And I think I might actually kind of answer that in the demo okay. um, and show you how you can find. So Lawrence is looking for studies that are useful for studying mental health, but also physical health. Um, and biomarkers. And so there is actually a way you can kind of narrow down the studies in the catalog to um, studies that will include those types of measures. So I will um, show that very soon. I think that will be the easiest way. Um, and so if anyone's having any problem accessing the catalog, just let us know in the chat or the Q&A. Um, but if everything's going okay, I will try and share my screen. If you can see that. Um, and so I'll give you a kind of quick tour of the catalog and a bit of a demo on how um, you can use it to answer those types of questions. So here, of course, we have um, our homepage, which you just saw on the Weezer slides as well, where we try to um, offer kind of some overview information and links to where you can find different things in the catalog. But um, before we get into kind of the search function. I'll just show you all up here we have um, kind of some of our side pages which can um, provide a little bit more context to the catalog or a little bit more detail about um, some of the topics that we um, cover. So in the, this project section we have our pages that provide some background and gathering the information um, which will kind of cover the detail that Louise just kind of provided to you all, so if you need more access to that or want a bit more detail, you can find that there and a guide to using the catalog as well. And then this COVID page, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Um, and then in this mental health and wellbeing section, this is where we're really trying to support researchers who maybe uh, are specifically mental health researchers or they don't typically use longitudinal research. So on this page, we provide a bit of background into longitudinal data in the UK. Um, and then on this page here, we um, provide a bit of overview information about some of the really widely used mental health measures on the catalog as well. Um, and so here you can see, for example, for the audit, we provide just a brief overview of the measure as well as some of the key references that people can go to. And I think what we're doing on this page is trying to give people a starting point to then go and find more information themselves to try and expedite that rather than saying, oh, this is the best measure and you should use it in your study, more to kind of provide people with the information so they can make that decision themselves. Um, and so then we also have this page about harmonization as well, where we talk a little bit about um, the harmonization of measures and then highlight some projects that are working in the area as well. 
Then in our resources section, we have um, our training page, which we're hoping to update soon with all of the new online training that has emerged in the last year. Um, and then hopefully soon we'll have our expert panel there as well. But really the core of the catalog is over here in the search um, functionality of the catalog. So what you can see here is we have all of the amazing longitudinal studies on the catalog listed here. In fact, we have 42. And so of course the first way you could have a look through if you're not really familiar with the studies is to just scroll through and see um, have a click on the one that you think is interesting, but that could be quite laborious. So what we have here is our search bar. So like it says here, you can search for the name of a study, a particular measure you're interested in, or a mental health topic that you're interested in. So let's say I'm interested in well-being. So I could just type in well-being here, and then it will really, it will start cutting down the studies here. So you can see there's still 33 studies that have measured psychological well-being in the catalog, which is great. But again, that's quite a few. So to narrow them down, I can use these filters as well. So the first filter here is um, the kind of related themes. And so these are topics that we think researchers might be interested in, but which we don't provide detailed information about. So we provide a lot of detailed information about the mental health measures. Um, but maybe not about diet, nutrition, or ethnicity and race, but we know people might be interested in that. So, for example, Lawrence was saying that they're interested in studies that have um, biomarkers, so you could use that filter to cut down to only those studies. Or if you're interested in physical health, we also have a physical health filter as well. So those are studies that have collected measures that are related to that. We also have a um COVID filter as well and so this will filter for studies that have collected new data during the pandemic um, because we know a lot of people are very interested in that and the studies have been working really hard to get that data prepared and ready to release so let's say I want to make sure there's COVID data and I also want genetic data as well um, to have been collected by the study. So that cuts me down to 16 studies, but I still feel like that's too many. So then we can use these other filters as well to reduce the number. So this one here is the age of recruitment of the participants. So I'm interested in studies that have data from early childhood. So let's say I want the participants to be recruited before they were six, um, but I want I don't want them to still be um, children. So maybe I want the study to have started a little earlier. So maybe I want it to have started before 1978. And you can also bring these up as well, because like you can see, we've got studies that started as early as 1931. So you can play around with these and similarly with the sample size as well. Um, and so then you can see we're down to two studies here. So we've got BCS 70 and the 1958 cohort. So let's say we're interested in the 1970 cohort. And so here is our page for each study. So every study has this information available. And so what we're trying to do in this section is provide some overview information so that users can work out whether uh, the data from this study is suitable to their needs um, and what they're interested in looking at. So you can see here we have the overview information, which provides some brief detail about the original aims of the study, the institution where it's based, the geographic coverage um, as well, because we have some that cover all of the UK or specific regions or even some international um, cohorts in addition to the UK. Then here we have information about the sample. So we know that this is a birth cohort study and we know um, a little bit more about how they were recruited because um, that's, of course, extremely important. Um, the number of uh, participants at recruitment and at a recent sweep um, and the age of recruitment, that sort of thing as well. So then we come down here and we have our data section. So like Louise said, we don't hold the data, provide access to data, anything like that. But what we do try and do is, again, provide the first piece of information that users can then take and um, pursue on their own. So um, we know that BCS70 is on the UK data service, which is great. And then we provide the link as well to how 
um, their guide for how to access the data. We just have here as well that they have collected genetic data and routinely collected administrative data is also linked, which is great. Then some extra information about their website um, and a core reference paper as well, which will hopefully be useful to people to get a bit more detail than what we provide here. But then the most detailed section down here is our mental health measures timeline. And this is where we hold the really detailed information about the specific measures. So the timeline you can see here covers the whole life of the study. Just make this a little bit wider. Um, and you can see that each dot here represents a different data collection event. Oh, my internet is going a little bit slowly. Okay, that's cool. Um, and so what you could do is browse through um, or you could search as well. But maybe I'm interested in browsing. What did they collect at age 10? So you can see we provide some of the top line information here. So the topic, this is the mental health topic that the measure is measuring. So here we can see we have a measure of ADHD, emotional behavioral problems. Then we have the name of the scale. So if this is a standard scale, we'll have that name here. So like the Connors hyperactivity scale, or if it's a non-standard instrument, we'll provide just a little bit more detail about what the questions are about. The focus is, of course, the person that the measure is about. So here we have the cohort member, but we also um, provide information about measures of mental health in anyone in the cohort member's family from their generation or older. So siblings, parents, grandparents, that sort of thing. Then we have the informant, so the person who provided the information. So we can see here we have mother, teacher report, and self-report, which is great. And then you can also um, sort by whether it's a standard instrument or not, because we know some people might prefer to use standard instruments. Um, and But we're interested in well-being. So let's type in well-being. And so what you can see here is the trees will grow where the well-being measures are. So then you can have a look through and say, maybe I'm actually interested in well-being when they're a bit older. So age 42, we can see that there was three well-being measures here, but where I like the look of this work, Enabra scale. So what you can do is click on the measure, and that's this is where we provide that really fine-grained detail. So we have the reporting term for the measure, the specific items that we use, and the response scale as well. If there is anything particular about the way a measure was collected or unusual, we also can include comments here as well. Um, and what you can see as well is we have this eye and that provides a little bit more overview information about um, some of the standard measures as well. So that's kind of how that page works. Um, but say we've decided, oh, we're interested in this and I'm interested in using the work Edinburgh scale. So I could also search for the name of the scale as well. So you can see here there's seven studies in total. But also if I know that I want to access uh, the BCS70 data and I want other data that's available on the UK data service, you can also search. It's better if you use the inverted commas, but if you search UK data service, then it will filter down to the studies that have deposited their data at the archive, which um, might be helpful for some people as well to know that that data is available there. Um, and just in terms of the COVID data as well, of course, we can use this filter here just to filter down to the studies. Um, but we also have, if you're, to kind of get the information on the catalog quite quickly, we also created this COVID page. Um, and this is where we provide slightly higher level information, but in a way that's easier to compare across studies as well. So here on our COVID timeline, rather than being data collection points in one study, we provide information about the data collection in all of our studies that um, have been trying to collect data during the pandemic. So each dot here is a month in 2020. It gets a little bit further as time goes on to um, 2021. Um, but what you can see here is say we're interested in August, you can have a look and see all of the studies that are on the catalog that have collected data in August 2020. And then if you click on them here, you can see the specific measures they used and then which participants were included. Um, we know for some studies, if we look at maybe, if we look at ALSPAC, for example, or 
collected. Sometimes they've collected data from the cohort members and their parents or and their partners. Um, the method, this is of course mostly online questionnaires during the pandemic, but for some of the aging studies, we also have telephone um, interviews as well. And then information about data access, because we know uh, a lot of these studies have been working hard to get their data deposited quite quickly um, as well. So that's kind of an overview of the catalog um, and how to use it. I don't know if we have any questions that have come up. I can see the Q&A. Yes, so that one's we, do, we, we do have um, one question which was, um, uh, yeah, information about uh, which regions, which I think that you covered, that, that question kind of appeared before you kind of got to the page, uh, the study page. So yes, there is information about which regions are covered by the study. If you go on the study page, it will kind of um, provide this information. And I think it's important to mention that this is an inception. So recruit recruitment, of course, uh, being part of a longitudinal study, people are moving around. So it doesn't give information about where, where they are now, but it mm. provides information about where they were um, at inception. And then um, type of places, so urban, semi, urban, rural. Um, I don't think that we do have that kind of information in the, uh, in the catalog, but I think that this is something that you could find if you kind of read the reference paper that we provide, probably there is that kind of fine grain information in those papers. Yeah, and I think if you browse through some studies, maybe if you're interested in a specific region, um, you they kind of come up by name. So we know like for born in Bradford, um, they're listed as, of course, being in West Yorkshire and Bradford. Um, and then we have some of the other studies like the cognitive function and aging studies. Um, the original CFAS study has... Um, yeah, a sample from Cambridgeshire, Wales, Newcastle, and that sort of thing as well. But yeah, that's probably the best way to find that information. I don't know if there's any other questions in the chat, maybe? Oh yeah, there was a question about looking at um, adverse childhood trauma. So I think mm -hmm. using the filter, you can have information about this. Um, so that was that happened before you. That question kind of appeared before you kind of uh, explained the filters. So in, it does partly address that. Um, so we don't cover or we don't go into providing details about childhood trauma, but we will kind of highlight studies that have measures of. Um, of trauma or adverse experience. Mm. Um, and these, these filters are by no means kind of everything um, that could be matched, you know, with mental health. Um, if you think of something that would be extremely helpful, you, you, can, you can kind of make your su suggestions in the uh, chat box that would be helpful. Yeah. It looks like that's all the questions for now. We do have an activity that we usually um, get if you you could post that on your slide. So this is to give everyone a chance to really have a play around with the catalog. Um, and so what we're looking for is a study that meets these criteria. So we're interesting, interested in finding a study that has measures of ADHD that's useful for studying education as well as studying um, ethnicity and race and we want the participants to again be recruited before they turn to five so hopefully um, you're all able to access the catalog and have a look through the search feature once you find it please put it in the chat and we'll see who can get there first Yes, there should only be one, but which which study is it? Which? <laughs> wow, that was quick. I hope there's only one. That's what I was. That's what I'm intending. That sometimes it doesn't quite work out that way. MCS yes. seems like Amy and Senorita maybe or Paula got it first. Um, yes, so that one is MCS. Maybe I will quickly show you. Oh no, I don't think there's a need to show. But if anyone has any questions about how to access that. What was my can stop sharing. Or... No, no, that's fine. And then we have one more, which is our, usually our slightly more difficult one. Um, 
which is really about getting into the mental health measures timeline. So if you can get your way to growing up in Scotland, birth cohort one, and this one is slightly tricky because there are three growing up in Scotland cohorts on the catalogue, but if you can get to birth cohort one, we would love to know if you can find how many times SDQ has been collected. Um, and then as a bonus round, who, which performance <laughs> provided the information yeah we don't have budget for prizes Bridget Unfortunately. yeah we need to start giving away plant cuttings or something yes that's what that that we can I can cover outside Seems my budget yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought that the uh, previous answer was quite quick actually yes that was one of the fastest we've ever had Ooh. so well done everyone Instrument. There's a question in the Q&A. Yes. Mm. Can so, we... Patrick, yeah. Should we answer now or should we wait? Should we wait a little bit just to... So that people probably are kind of um, going through the search and everything, so... So, Louise, you actually have the answers to this one. I know. So Edmund says the SDQ has been collected six times. So does Matthias. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, dear. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, it looks like Jinglin has got it as well. Yes. And who the cohort members? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Kara, <laughs> teacher self report. Yes. Claire and Amy got all three first try. So, yeah, clearly there's a lot of really detailed data available there. So, that's great. It, everyone managed to find it, which is reassuring that the catalog is easy enough to use. Um, and so then I guess one more question from Patrick, which was oh. asking whether you can filter by instruments included. So the measures with the IADL, which I'm not actually familiar with, or the SF6. So that is somewhere where it's really useful to search. So if it's a mental health measure, um, you can just search for the name of the measure um, and all the studies that include that instrument will be included. So the SF6 would definitely work because that is a measure of psychological distress that we include on the catalog. Same for the SDQ or basically any standard measure of mental health. Um, I'm not sure about the IADL. If that's a measure of like physical health or um, basically something not related to mental health, then we don't have the ability to uh, search right now. Yeah, so both are physical health measures. We don't have specific physical health measures on there right now unless it could also be used as a mental health measure. So the short form health survey, you actually can search and it's been used quite a lot in the cohorts and maybe that's a little side way to searching for that. Uh, we, may, we may want in the future that would probably be part of our plan to kind of, um, depending on funding, but this is something that we would want to do uh, include physical health measures as well. That could be good. Yeah. Okay, great. I don't think there are any more questions yet. So I guess we can continue, Louise. No. So shall we move on to the next slide? Great. Yes. Um, so just to give you an idea, I think that um, it was quite pleasing for us to kind of realize that um, it was working, you know, I think that this this kind of started as being a wild idea, not, not being too sure whether people would use it, whether it was kind of useful and whether cohort studies would work with, with us in making this happen. And we launched the catalog in November 2019, and it seems to be working well. So we do kind of follow the analytics, you know, uh, of our website. And just to let you know that, um, you know, the users are quite multiple. You just sent that information to me earlier today, Bridget. Um, but, but it is not just used by people in the UK, but it is used by people around the world. So that is, um, that is wonderful to know that uh, people from different countries, from different backgrounds are using the catalog to find out more information about the um, measures that, of mental health that are available uh, for their research. Um, so in some ways, I think that um, at the moment, we're kind of finalizing um, the cohort study. So I mentioned ALSPAC. ALSPAC is a huge cohort. Um, and Lily kind of just finished um, reviewing it with, um, 
with Bridget and um, at the moment the file is with John so it should be kind of uploaded kind of fairly soon hopefully yes and then it will take us a while to kind of making sure everything is all right share it with the team to make sure that they're happy with it so it should be released you know at the end of the month fingers crossed and we do have a few more um, studies to um, they are all reviewed we're waiting for the study team to tell us that they're fine um, and then we're kind of considering um, what else would be valuable. So it would be great to hear from you, um, telling us what would be valuable for your program of research on mental health. Um, but we think that, um, and that was mentioned by other people, that maybe having a few international cohorts would be helpful. So that would provide some kind of um, a baseline or kind of um, an indication about what is being done outside the UK. So for example, one of the most common measures used in the UK for children's mental health would be the SDQ, uh, the Strength and Difficulty Questionnaire. But if you look outside the UK, it's not used that often. You know, the CBCL would be more used. So in some ways, I think it's important to, to have some kind of um, uh, reference, you know, outside the UK. Um, we want to provide more resources for people who want to use those data, so providing more information about online training courses. We also want to develop a panel of experts um, who would very kindly offer their suggestions and help for people who are not familiar with mental health measures. Um, so now that we have something which was which is up and running, I think that we're in a good position to approach people saying, hey, do you want to be part of it? Before, I think it was a little bit tricky because we didn't have anything to show. But now I think um, we have something solid that we can that we can propose to a panel of experts. Um, and I also mentioned to you that maybe we would want to broaden the concept of mental health and, and well-being. I think that we need to revisit what we've decided to include. So um, I mentioned kind of personality, temperament that are not included. We may want to kind of um, revisit that decision. There's also kind of discussion about including mental health, uh, uh, physical health measures as part of the catalog. And one thing which I think would be extremely helpful would be to have another catalog um, with risk factors, uh, probably kind of social risk factors, and that those two catalogs could kind of speak to each other. I think that that could be instead of just having those filters, which are helpful, but then we can do uh, something similar that we did for mental health for kind of social risk factors that could be helpful. So some of them are really kind of ongoing, something that we've already kind of doing or we want to plan, we're planning to do kind of quite soon. Other things are much more kind of dream wish list, um, depending on the, um, on the uh, funding, of course, as always. Um, so we have a bit more time for, but before, um, oh wait, whoop, whoop, um, just yes, just want to say that it's, um, we don't see the catalog as being something fixed and we don't think it's perfect or it is correct. It's a little bit like Wikipedia, so it's kind of nice when people kind of get in touch and they tell us, you know, it happened in the past. Some people kind of said, hey, what about our cohort study? So then we're very happy if they meet the criteria. We're happy to kind of include or to discover kind of new cohort studies. That's great. If you find a mistake, that's um, good as well. If you tell us what would be helpful for you, that would be great. And you can also join our mailing list. How do they do that, Bridget? Are you muted? Sorry, I'm mute. This QR code here should lead you to join our mailing list or if you just go to the home page um, and scroll down, there's a little form there that you can just type in your email and yeah, you'll be kept up to date. Um, I think that we have more questions. Can we? Yeah, so we just have one from Corinne. Sorry yeah. if I didn't pronounce that. Um, but they asked um, about our filter to linkage to administrative data. Um, they are specific if it's specifically noted anywhere if the data has been linked to mental health service use. No, we don't have that specifically. I think um, there are some other platforms. So you may have heard of the Adolescent Data Platform, I think, with Anne John and Swansea. That's what she does. She does really only kind of administrative data for young people. Um, young people's kind of um, use of mental health services. And um, uh, so you may want to kind of 
access that platform. I think it's really complicated um, to use that and to transform the information and scripts and, and all of that. So this is something that we could not take uh, on board, but I think that for Wales and kind of provide that kind of information. Um, mm -hmm. If you are specifically interested in mental health service use, we do include measures of like self-reported um, service use or treatment. But yeah, like Louise said, not a lot of fine-grained detail about linked administrative data right now. And then I think Claudia has asked, um, I was wondering if it's possible to not just access the questions used in the questionnaire, but how to score the questionnaire. So we provide the response scales that participants um, had available um, because, of course, sometimes for the same questionnaire they'll be or the same instrument they'll be offered a yes-no answer or like a four-point scale, five-point scale. So we do provide that there, but we don't um, – the information we provide is based on – what was collected, but not necessarily the way it's scored by the studies. Um, so I guess when you're getting to that next level of accessing the data, that's when um, you'll be able to look into the specific values provided with the score. But if you're interested in the response options, we do provide that information just below where the items are in the timeline. Great. Um, there are no more questions, I think, and uh, it's four o'clock, so I think that we can um, move on to our next speaker, Beata, who will explain more about the um, yeah UK data service, what service they can provide uh, when it comes to mental health. And please stay on stay online after to kind of fill the um, fill the the survey. Um, and we'll, we'll stay as well. So please, if you have any more questions, we'll stay online for a bit longer. Great. Thank you. The UK Data Service Introduction to Data on Mental Health, just to give uh, some more information where you can find data on mental health and also how to access many of the data sets that Louise and Bridget have introduced to you, uh, which contain information on mental health. So the roadmap for me today will be um, who are we, so uh, what data are available via the UK Data Service, and third, where to find and access data resources and help. So first of all, what is the UK Data Service? It is a comprehensive resource funded by the ESRC. It's a single point of access to a wide range of secondary social science data, and we provide access, support, training, and guidance. This is a website of the UK Data Service. And uh, one thing I would like to, to highlight is you will get all the slides and the recording of today uh, on our website. So you go to news and events, and on the left-hand side, you see events and past events. So today it's events, but tomorrow it will be past events. And you will find the webinar, the catalog of mental health measures. And when you click on that link, you will then also see the slides and the recording. So who is the UK Data Service for? It is for academic researchers and students, it is for government analysts, it is for charities and foundations, business consultants, independent research centers and think tanks. Our data sources come from official agencies, so mainly central government, but we have international statistical time series as well, and we get data from individual academics. So once you finish your research grant, three months after um, your project stops, you are, you are um, ask to submit your data to the UK Data Service, and uh, we need to make them available for research. So we get data from market research agencies, we hold public records uh, from historical sources, and we also have access to international data via links with other data archives worldwide. The types of data collections we hold are survey microdata, aggregate statistics, census data, and qualitative and mixed methods data. So this is an overview of our key data. And on the left-hand side in the green box, you can see our access levels. So we have 786 open data available, 6,985 safeguarded data, and 202, uh, 224 controlled data, out of which 176 are secure lab data, which you can access remotely from your institution, and 48 out of those control data, our secure lab data, safe room access only data. So you would need to come to our safe room here at the University of Essex 
and then you could access the data. However, at the moment, due to COVID-19, this is not possible, but we hope it will be possible very soon. So our key data are UK survey data, which are large-scale government-funded surveys, like the annual population surveys, the labor force survey, et cetera, et cetera. Then we have the longitudinal surveys following individuals over time, which um, Louise and Richard already mentioned um, previously. Then we have the international macro and micro data. We have qualitative um, and mixed methods data, census data, business microdata, which are mainly our secure lab data. And we also have records for administrative data for which the ADRN has negotiated researcher access. And finally, and this is um, uh, my personal pleasure to announce, we have international controlled microdata, so controlled data, uh, secure lab data. Um, so we make an IRB, Institute for Employment Research, a German um, controlled microdata available via our safe room, and also French controlled microdata. So this is mirrored on our website, the structure I just showed to you. So you can see here, uh, use the key data, the same structure. Now, I would like to say um, a little bit more about the International Data Access Network. I'm representing the UK Data Service in that network. And the project is a collaboration between six research data centers from four countries, France, Germany, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom. And the aim is to facilitate research use of controlled access data between the RDCs via a reciprocal provision of safe from remote desktop access. So we have international controlled microdata from the French Secure Access Data Center. And here I have provided the link to the data and also how to apply for it. Just to uh, highlight the relevance for what we are talking about today, I have just listed themes and highlighted in orange that there's also data available on health, handicap, and dependency, for example. And the same for the um, German controlled data that we make available. Here I have put together some snippets from their website and again highlighted in orange the study on mental health at work. Um, so that is of relevance as well, just to, to give you an idea of what international control data would be available and you could access them via our safe room once it is open again. Now, these are just some examples of the longitudinal data that are available via the UK data service. And um, it was already mentioned before. So we have, for example, the four long cohort studies, the 1958 National Child Development Study, NCDS, the 1970 British Cohort Study, BCS70, the Millennium Cohort Study, and then also the Next Step Study, previous no, previously known as the Longitudinal Study of Young People in England. And that fits in quite nicely in between um, the British Cohort Study and the Millennium Cohort Study. Um, as, as it is of the date 1989 and 90. So it, it actually shortens the gap between those two. And it was acquired a little bit later. Then we have the British Household Panel Survey and its successor understanding society or also known under the name UK Household Longitudinal Study. Then we have families and children study. Ah, I also wanted to mention that actually this uh, understanding society study has 100,000 individuals in 40,000 British households. It's enormous. So the British Household Panel Survey, which is included um, in the understanding society study, had 5,500. So it's, it's fourfold, if you wish. And then we have English Longitude Study of Aging, Families and Children Study, Our Future Growing Up in Scotland, and all the closer resources, et cetera, et cetera. I can't name them all. And also, I know you're quite tired, presumably, after one hour. So I try to keep it uh, to a minimum. We have all our information on COVID-19 uh, available on our website, the URL on top. And then also this is the starting page and then you can go into details what data are available co containing COVID-19 information. And these are not only um, new data sets specially designed to study cooperating additional modules, if you wish, um, on COVID-19 related topics. So we have our normal UK service, for example, also including now information on COVID-19. So um, obviously the longitudinal studies that were already mentioned, so I don't need to repeat that, but for example, the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey COVID-19 module is available, or um, so uh, the ONS coronavirus study 
is available via the UK Data Service, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you have lots of additional studies on COVID-19 data and mental health. They include um, topics as well available. Now, how would you find the data? So you could, you could search um, by going to get data on the left-hand side, key data, and then just search for longitudinal studies if you want to um, just look at longitudinal studies. Or you could go to the data catalog and you can here search for studies and you don't need to specify longitudinal studies, for example, and just type mental health. And you see um, circled in orange that we have 252 studies containing information on mental health. And actually, when you go down that uh, result list of 10 pages, but I mean on the first page, just a bit um, down the first page, you will find the catalog of mental health measures 2020. So that's exactly what... Um, uh, Louise and Bridget were talking about. Now, if you don't really want to scroll through uh, 252 studies on mental health, you might uh, just look at the series. So, for example, the psychiatric mobility surveys, and then you can actually dwell down and look at the different studies involved in that series. So that would be maybe a little bit easier. I think it's more, um, <laughs> more doable than, than looking at 252. Now, data access. Who can actually access our data? Well, basically all registered users. So however, which data can be accessed and the particular access conditions vary according to the user type. So whether you're from a higher institution, further in education, higher education, further education institution, or, or whether you are from a non-higher education, further education institution, or even non-UK researcher. Then second, it depends on the usage, so on the project characteristics, and also whether it's commercial or non-commercial. And uh, lastly, on the specific data access conditions attached to the chosen data. So here, whether it is an end user license data set, or a special license data set, or a special conditions data set, or a secure lab data access or safe room access data set. Now, basically, it's mainly web access, but this only applies to open and safeguarded data, not to secure lab data. And uh, those first two categories are freely available for use in higher education institutions. We supply the data in a variety of formats. So in uh, SPSS data format as databases, and, but also as word process documents and PDF documents for qualitative data sets, for example. Now, how to access the data step by step? So first you would register with us. You would then agree to an end user license. You would select the data from the catalog, specify a project, um, describing it in 30 words. Then you could download the data to your machine if it is open or safeguarded data, or you place an order for the other data and complete all relevant forms and we take it from there. This process is actually um, uh, shown on our website under get data, how to access, download and order. And this is actually the process for secure lab data, remote access to secure lab data, so you would not be able to download the data onto your computer because access is via a web-based interface that uses secure encrypted Citrix virtual private network technology. And the data is not downloadable, as I said, the access is only remotely possible from your organizational desktop. However, now during uh, COVID-19 emergency, we have special agreements in place and our website will tell you what these are um, in order to make the data access accessible because it is more than ever important to get to the data and actually provide um, good research for decision making. Now, the outputs are all subject to statistical disclosure control. So basically the whole process is um, in this graph. So you register, order the data, become an approved researcher. Then you have to complete a service agreement. You complete a training. This is a safe researcher training that lasts four hours and is provided online at the moment. It used to be face-to-face -face one day in London. Then you will receive your unique login. You can work remotely in the secure lab and then you will place an output request. We check it for SDC. And then once everything is okay, you can publish uh, your results and we can actually before release it to you to do so. Now, as I said, we have three access levels broadly open, safeguarded, and controlled. I think um, you might just need to know more about it once you know which data set you need. So let's just continue to support and resources being fully aware of the time. 
So we have lots of support and resources available. We provide video tutorials and webinars. We have also data skills modules available online. So for example, on longitudinal data, we have a module which is in the box on the right hand side. And you can see here what units it consists of. And then I have also provided the URL so you can easily find it. We have case studies available, so you can get an idea of what other researchers did or what, what could be done. Uh, we have guides and themes. We have advice on managing and sharing data and also on teaching with our data and providing resources for that. And then also we run a help desk and individual user support. Now, video tutorials you would find under use data and video tutorials, case studies under use data and data in use. And uh, they are grouped. And here you also find the, the group health and well-being. So this is where you would go to find case studies um, on mental health, obviously. Teaching with data. Um, our data are well used for teaching. You find advice under use data, teaching with data. And here you see how to register your class, um, teaching resources available, ideas even for teaching. And finally, health. So we have FAQs and um, also the, the usual get in touch um, online forms. We have a telephone number. At the moment, it is advisable to email. And we are on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. That's it for me. Any question, please ask now or write an email to support at ukdataservice.ac.uk.